Um, so I'm going to move on to Imran Mir. Um, Imran Mir is a Kashmiri and an American, an attorney and an entrepreneur who has researched and written widely on various topics um, related to Kashmir, including its modern history. Um, and that is, history is what Imran will be speaking to us about. So Imran, I'd like to um, ask you to situate these new domicile rules uh, within a longer political history of, um, you know, step-by-step -step sort of settler colonialism um, in, in the region. Um, and, you know, how does it play out in terms of economic and environmental effects? So I'll turn it over to you. Um, so you'll forgive me because I'm going to be, I have some prepared remarks when you're reading, so I'll be looking away a little bit, but I will look up as well. Um, a commentator recently described the new domicile rules in any minister, Jammu and Kashmir, and I'll use the term IAJK, as a master stroke by the Indian government, and they are. And what I'm going to try to do is explain to you why that's the case. These rules are part of a policy program developed over decades. Since August of 2019, we have witnessed an accelerated implementation phase of that program. The Indian government's institutionalized system of intensive militarization, state violence, and legalized impunity has expanded. While rampant human rights violations and acts constituting crimes against humanity continue. In this context, the new policies underscore several things. The total domination by the Indian government of the marginalized peoples of IAJK, that resistance or even contemplating resistance is futile and criminal, that those peoples have no rights and no freedoms, no right to speak, no right to assemble, no right to communicate, no right to work, no right to education, no right to health care, no right to mourn their dead, and no right to exist. And it's this last bit that is the ultimate intent of these policies, to destroy any existence in IAJK and that the peoples of IAJK would choose or recognize as their own. To understand that intent, you need to situate this conversation in Hindutva. Hindutva is a movement that was founded in the 1920s. It was built out in the 1930s using methods borrowed from Italian fascists and Nazi Germans, and it is dominant, as you all know, in India today. Hindutva imagines a fictional past where a race of Hindus lived in a glorious Hindu holy land called Bharat or India. In the Hindutva view, Muslims are foreign invaders in that holy land who must be subjugated or purged in order to restore past glory. This militant, ultranationalist, supremacist ideology is the operative ideology of the Indian state. In its political form, Hindutva merges two things, supremacist ultranationalism with the rapacious mode of capitalism. The Hindutva worldview separates territory or land from its indigenous people. For the Indian government, the territory of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, and I'll refer to it as JMK, is integral to India. In their view, the fact of undesirable peoples in IAJK, and particularly Muslims, is a historical mistake that needs to be corrected. The idea that those undesirables demand any rights, let alone a right to self-determination, is an abomination that cannot and will not be tolerated. In line with Hindu ideology, then, the Indian government has implemented policies in IAJK to, as Mirza said, annex the territory outright, make the exercise of self-determination by the indigenous people practically impossible, and set in motion a process of demographic change. To rid the land of its undesirable population or to vanquish and subjugate that population through legalized discrimination, violence, and forced population transfer. To help illustrate how these domicile rules work to further that plan, I want you to consider the following two hypothetical examples and how in each case these rules are expected to apply. Person one is the son of an Indian military officer from Bihar who did a few tours in Kashmir over 10 years. That officer is responsible for acts constituting war crimes and crimes against humanity. His son has never set foot in IAJK and has no connection to it. However, under the application of the new rules, his son has preferential access to education and jobs in IAJK. He can incitement by leading Hindutva politicians. He's excited about buying property in an exotic place 
and perhaps marrying a fair Kashmiri girl, and thereby serve his country by helping to, quote, integrate Kashmir. Under these new rules, person one need only show up with a birth certificate and documentation showing that of his parents' military service, wait 15 business days, and acquire the legal rights to do everything that he wants in Kashmir. Now consider a second case. Person two is a Kashmiri woman from a family who has lived in Kashmir for at least a millennium. She's from a typical Kashmiri family, modest means. Her relatives have invested whatever they could to support her education in the hopes that she would one day get a government job, her only prospect for rising out of a subsistence existence. However, under the new rules, Person two now needs to establish herself as a domicile in IAJK in order to be eligible for employment. She faces two major challenges. First, she doesn't have the PRC or state subject certificate she needs because she, like many, lost her belongings, including her important documents, in the floods of 2014 that caused widespread property damage in IAJK. Second, she has to get two Indian bureaucrats to grant her critical approvals, one to replace her lost certificate and one to grant this newly imposed domicile status. These Indian officials know that, like the NRC process in Assam, they are supposed to discriminate to meet the Indian government's policy intent. She is supposed to be denied. And she has no meaningful recourse to that denial. Consequently, she, like her entire family and community, are faced with overwhelming political and economic pressure imposed by agents of an all-powerful state and the flood of Hindutva activist settlers, like person one, to sell what property they have left to survive. She now has no use for her education, no access to employment, no access to employment in her homeland. The certificate that an indigenous person from IAJK needs now to apply for this domicile status is referred to as a PRC or a state subject certificate. The definition of state subjects in JNK came out of a social mobilization that began in the 1890s. A group of ethnic Kashmiri Hindus or pundits felt threatened by people from Punjab taking government jobs in JNK. Pundits traditionally held those jobs which furnished their community with wealth and power and allowed them to maintain a system of social domination over the masses of Kashmir. Their movement slogan was Kashmir for the Kashmiris, but in reality, there was a movement for privileges for the privileged. They persuaded the ruler of JNK to implement laws that defined the indigenous people of JNK as state subjects and granted those people certain privileges in their homeland including exclusive access to state employment, access to education in local institutions, and the right to own property. These privileges were only intended for the privileged because the masses, as a matter of institutionalized discrimination, denied the opportunity to avail themselves of those privileges. And those denied were predominantly Muslim. There, were, there was also at the same time, however, another major social movement that got its start in JNK in the 1890s. This other social movement was a pro-democracy movement with multi-ethnic, multi-religious representation. It sought an end to legalize discrimination, economic exploitation, and tyranny in JNK, and ultimately sought self-determination. Through the 1930s and 1940s, despite severe repression and state violence, that pro-democracy movement succeeded in transforming state subject rights into something that all state subjects could actually benefit from. So through struggle and sacrifice, people transformed a tool designed to further and maintain privilege into a tool of social justice. Since 1947, these state subject rights have been guaranteed, and Mirza covered this, by international law, JNK law, and the Indian Constitution. They were also guaranteed by the treaty called the Instrument of Accession that the Indian government claims granted a territorial right to JNK. However, despite those guarantees, those state subject rights and the related victories of that pro-democracy movement have now been erased. As I mentioned, that pro-democracy movement also sought to end economic exploitation. Its major victory in this area was land reform. Basically, until 1950, the ruling regime gave its officials and allies who were mostly Hindus 
landed estates formed by rightless, landless peasants who were Muslims. Starting in 1950, these estates were broken up and small tracts were given to farmers. These small land holdings have been the economic lifeblood of IAJK through the last seven decades of political instability, personal insecurity, and state violence. I mention this because one of the major but overlooked targets of the policies implemented by, implemented by the Indian government in August is the gutting of this land holding system and the reintroduction of a legalized system of economic exploitation for the private benefit of the corporate allies of the ruling regime. From this bit of history, I want you to see that the people of JNK have suffered and struggled for a long time. And through struggle and sacrifice, they did achieve certain victories. However, everything that they won has now been stripped away. And their suffering continues. In reality, those victories were always tenuous because the ultimate goal of that pro-democracy movement, which was self-determination, was never achieved. It is also important to understand that the Hindutva project regarding JNK is not new. Since partition, the at least nominal autonomy of IAJK in India and the special rights of its peoples have been an obsession of the Hindutva movement. Hindutva parties have long insisted that JNK was an integral part of India. They viewed autonomy as a violation of India's sovereignty, and they wanted a quote, complete integration of JNK with India. In India's early days, when despite its many failures as a state, international law apparently did mean something to the Indian government, these views were fringe views. However, for the last few decades, these Hindutva views are not only mainstream in India, they are strict orthodoxy. Hindutva has underpinned the Indian government's policy towards IAJK for decades, including under governments formed by secular nationalist parties. Hence, the now often repeated phrase, that Kashmir is an integral part of India. After seven decades, the Indian government has now achieved that complete integration. The disintegration of JNK, and now the destruction of any existence that its people would recognize as their own are major Hindutva accomplishments. We don't know how the planned destruction of the peoples of IAJK will actually manifest. The people who stand to gain are those aligned with the Hindutva movement. Hindutva activists, their corporate allies, the Indian military, some high caste Hindus, some Buddhist chauvinists. For IAJK's Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, low caste Hindus, nomads, non Hindu refugees, the Indian government's Hindutva policies are a disaster and an existential threat. As we consider what is happening in IAJK and what we need to be doing about it, it is critical that we do not underestimate the depravity of the agents of Hindutva. They are shameless, bloodthirsty fanatics. Their leaders are lying sociopaths and terrorists who already have much innocent blood on their hands. They are actively working with, supporting, and inspiring supremacist nationalists, white nationalists, and anti-Muslim bigots all over the world. It is also critical that we recognize that the Indian government and its allies are extremely adept in the art of disinformation. Many people from AJK have internalized portions of that disinformation. Some of the states and institutions that exist in the world today, most of them, perceive a vested interest, both geopolitical and economic, in uncritically accepting, and in some cases, abetting that disinformation. I'm gonna end by recalling four historical episodes. The first is the 1992 demolition of the Babri Mosque. I encourage you to watch a video of that demolition. The successful Hindutva campaign to destroy that mosque is what the national popularity of Hindutva in India is built on. One of the first images that flashed through my mind on August 5, 2019, was of the Babri Mosque demolition, with the building being demolished in my mind was the Hanka of Shahamdan in Srinagar. Second, the 2002 program against the Muslims of Gujarat. Read about it. The government of Narendra Modi, then Gujarat's chief minister, under political momentum gained from the Babri Mosque demolition, facilitated a well-planned campaign to kill, rape, maim, dispossess thousands of Muslims, and then prevented those responsible 
from being held accountable. Modi's national reputation in India is built on that success. And in achieving the complete integration now of IAJK, he has, as a Hindutva foot soldier, earned himself another legendary accomplishment. Third, the 2018 murder of Asif Abana. Search for her name. She was an eight-year-old Muslim girl from a semi-nomadic Bakrawal family. She was kidnapped, imprisoned in the temple, starved, drugged, and repeatedly gang raped by eight Hindu men, including a retired government official and a police officer, before being strangulated and pummeled to death. Her murder was planned by her family's Hindu neighbors in order to drive Muslims out of Hindu majority areas of Jammu and to grab their land. And when I think about forced demographic change in Kashmir and what it could look like, the image of Asif Abano comes to my mind. And the last thing I'll mention is the 1947 Jammu massacre. In 11 weeks in the fall of 1947, Hindutva activists with state support killed approximately 10% of the Muslim population of Jammu. Standard estimates are 250,000 people. And they drove away hundreds of thousands of others. People fled to various places, many to those areas that are now called Azad Kashmir. I mentioned that the Hindutva project regarding JNK has been going on since partition. And I think one can fairly view the current threat of demographic change in IAJK as the unfinished business of that genocidal 1947 campaign. Given militarization, armored borders, and the demonization of IAJK's Muslims in India, it is unclear where, if anywhere, the dispossessed of IAJK could flee today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imran, for situating these latest events in, in a broad historical sphere of, um, sort of Hindutva imagination of the Indian nation state.